I remember from last time, and a number of new faces. So we'll look forward to the presentation and the discussion. Let's talk about returning to the office. So this is for you as project managers. Some of you are, well, you're all in a sort of a leadership role position as project managers. Some of you are in more leadership role. Some of you are just managing projects, not other people. But this is relevant to everyone, whether you're managing projects only or managing people. Generally, if you're managing projects, you're also managing people. You have to think about how you're returning to the office and you have to influence your companies to return to the office successfully. This is the time when vaccines are increasingly available, when many companies are deciding about their returning to the office plans. Fundamental part of conversations. I've consulted for 13 companies by now on this topic for returning to the office. And this presentation is developed based on the white paper I sent to Steve. That's, and I'll send to all of you who want the white paper. That's informed by 61 interviews I had with leaders at these 12 companies earlier and now another one, 13th one, where I help them advise on how to strategically return back to the office. So it's kind of one direction where I'm coming from. Personal experience on the ground, practical, relevant, as well as extensive research on best practices for returning to the office, remote work and hybrid work, as well as a number of surveys of what employees want in returning to the office. So it's very well researched, very well grounded in best practices. That's why I'm talking about benchmarking to best practices. That's where they're coming from. So just so that you know. Now for the structure of the presentation, what we'll do is we'll, I'll first talk about the statistics. What are the actual statistics on what people want? The surveys that are extensive surveys, I'll talk about them. So the surveys, then I'll talk about some of the mistakes that leaders tend to make the, in trying to bring people back to the office, not to make those. And finally, the third part of the presentation will be about best models for bringing people back to the office and how the related part of that is how do you adapt your office to the future permanent post pandemic work arrangements. So that's the structure of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. Without further ado, let's talk a little bit about how leaders are turning people back to the office a little bit before we talk about the statistics. Now, Leaders, you've probably heard leaders say a lot this phrase that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. People are our primary source of competitive advantage. These are phrases that are widely used by leaders, at the top of the organization, middle levels as well. People are our greatest resource. Unfortunately, as we're seeing increasingly in returning to the office, many leaders are failing to live by that principle. They're not really acting in accordance with that guidance. What happens is that leaders, by and large, are really comfortable with in-office culture. That's what we're seeing. Leaders really want their employees to get back to the office. They're comfortable with it. It's intuitive to them. I mean, some of them come from the old school of command and control. If I can't see you, you're not working sort of thing. And that's one of the things that's driving them. Some of them come from a set of experiences where for, you know, they have a 20, 30 year career, they're leaders of organizations and they have succeeded by coming to the office. They've succeeded by being in the office. They perceive that as the source of their success and they perceive that as the right way of doing things. And they feel that, hey, I, this is the right way of doing things. Everyone should do things this, is, this way because it's the right way of doing things. And they want to turn back the clock to that mentality, to that modality. They want to go back to January 2020, before the pandemic. So this is a problem because they're not realizing the reality of the major, major disruption that the pandemic has brought, where the pandemic has really shifted our values, our norms, our habits, our preferences in such a way that trying to go back to January 2020 is really undermining the message of people being your greatest resource because many people actually don't want that. They don't want to go back to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five. Now, uh, if you remember from last time, I did a number of polls throughout the presentation and I'll do the same thing this time as well. So I wanna ask you whether you ever observed during the pandemic, leaders failing to live by the principle that people are our greatest resource. So please go ahead and vote. Did you ever observe that? 
leaders failing to live by the principle that people are our greatest resource during the pandemic. Please go ahead and vote. All right, so I see the large majority of you all, great. Okay, so interesting. So we see just over half of you have seen that uh, as a problem and just under half of you didn't. So presuming we're talking about your company. So more than half of you saw this as a failing, as a problem. So it's something I'm describing. There are certainly a number of companies that are doing the return to the office the right way, but there are a number that, that are not doing it the right way. And just as during the pandemic, a number of companies acted well and appropriately, and not all companies really live by the mandate of people being the greatest resource. Let's talk about the statistics. So I talked about statistics surveys. These are surveys, just to let you know, they're eight widespread surveys published in early part of this year. So early 2021, sometime in the spring, different depending on the surveys, which part of it. And the surveys are done by highly reputable organizations. There's surveys done by the Harvard Business School. There's surveys done by SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management. A survey done by Microsoft, so the company which manages Microsoft Teams. So it's not simply a survey, it also had a lot of, and LinkedIn, so it had a lot of data points about what workers were doing and what kind of, how they were spending their time. Same thing for Slack. Slack did a combination of survey and using their data points, as well as for more reputable survey, you know, Harris Teeter, Harris Poll, and polling, and so on. Now, what did these surveys find? What were their findings? So return to full-time office work is ba they are basically finding that the return to full-time office work has serious problems for retention, retaining of their talent, for recruitment, getting more people in, for morale, for people feeling happy and productivity. It's really called going to cause a lot of problems in productivity. If you are trying to get people to go back to full-time office work. It's gonna stress people out, cause them to be damaged in work-life balance. It will harm their mental health and well-being, And therefore it will help company, it will not help company bottom lines. It will hurt company bottom lines. Because if you have bad retention, if you have bad recruitment, you have bad morale, bad productivity. And if your employees have bad work-life balance, mental health and well-being, you are not going to be using your greatest resource very well. It will not be a source of your competitive advantage. So that's what the surveys are finding. And I'll give you some specific numbers from the surveys and the white paper that I'll send out after the presentation has the in-depth description of the surveys as well as links to them. Let's talk about the surveys. So eight major independent surveys say that 85% of workers want substantial remote work, more than 85% of workers. Something like 15% less, depending on the survey, want to go back to the office full time. And something like 25%, anywhere from 25 to 35%, want full time remote work. And the rest, so about two thirds or so, want hybrid work, want to work for in the office maybe one to two days a week. So that's what the employees are saying. A related finding is that over 40% would leave their job if forced to come into full time, over 40%. And other service, so again, this I'm giving the bottom numbers. It's 40, it's over 40%. Depending on the survey, it goes from 42% to 58% would leave their job. 70%, over 70% are less likely to leave by contrast if offered substantial remote work. So if offered, you know, something like three days of work from home. So that's a first part of the survey findings. Second part of the survey findings is that working from home significantly improves people's state of well-being, people's health, people's mental health. So substantial work from home after COVID would make 75% of the people, over 75% of the people happier. They reported they would be happier and they would be less stressed and better able to manage work-life balance. You definitely want employees who are happy. Happy workers are productive workers, we know that. 
don't want people who are stressed. Stressed workers are unproductive workers and they also take more sick days. And of course, if your workers aren't managing work-life balance very well, they become burned out, stressed and so on. And so they become unproductive, un unhappy, unengaged. You don't want that. So working from home seriously improves well-being. So this is substantial work from home. This is something like three days a week, at least half the time, or you know, two and a half days, let's say that way, but at least half the time, but generally speaking, three days a week. Now, so an important finding that is that remote employees are on the all average quite a bit more productive. On average, workers work from home over 20 hours more per month when they are working from home when, when they're working remotely rather than they're working from the office, which makes sense. You know, they're not taking the time for their commute, which of course ate up into their the time that they would otherwise could spend working. They aren't doing walking from meeting to meetings. They aren't having these other interactions that are taking their time. 75% or more report higher or equal productivity and of course, only 25% remote report lower productivity. So this is a significant improvement. And employees would take 8% pay cut for substantial remote work. So your company can be more productive if it can save money on employees if you give them substantial remote work. And on average, when you look at the average of increase in productivity, there's been a 10, 10 to 14% increase in productivity per employee for working from home. Even more increase in productivity when you focus on their individual tasks, less so for collaborative tasks, which is one of the reasons why there's certainly benefits to having a hybrid schedule, which we'll talk about later. But there's no question that overall employees are much more productive when they're working from home. Now, there are a number of challenges with remote work, which is important to acknowledge. 50% of the people feel overworked, so that's a problem. 55% of the people experience burnout and 80% of the over 80% of the people want fewer meetings. The biggest issues in remote work are poor virtual communication and collaboration skills and technology issues. So these are the biggest problems that are noted with remote work, which of course can be addressed, fixed if you approach working remotely more effectively than many folks do. All right. Now we're going to do another poll, and I'm curious to ask you, what would be your preferred working style after the pandemic? Which of these would be your preferred working style? Fully remote, one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, or five days a week? See, 57% of you voted. So let's get, okay, great. Okay, so we see that overwhelmingly the hybrid model would win out. There's the very few people want full-time work in the office. Very few people want four days a week or three days a week. The largest majority of you would want one day in the office. So that's what would really work for you. And a substantial minority, 15%, would want the fully remote model. And very few would want full-time or close to full-time. Now, I want to see if there are any questions on these statistics before I move forward. So I'll take brief questions on the statistics before moving forward. Please go ahead, ask me any questions about the statistics. I know that this can sometimes be a confusing issue and there's a lot of numbers that, you know, if I get to the end of the presentation, people will forget. So I want to see if you have any questions, please go ahead, unmute yourselves or put them into the chat specifically on the statistics. Yeah, I have a question. Does the, yes. the data that we just saw represent what is typically you see? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so when I work with companies and when I work with, when I take polls, we generally see the same thing. So about a quarter to a third of the people want to work full-time remotely. In fact, there was a company that was pretty surprised um, when they found that 57% of their employees want to work fully remotely. So sometimes it's higher than that, but most of the time you'll see that it's something like in the order of a quarter to a third want to work fully remotely, most something like 60, 70% 
want to work a hybrid model and maybe you know 10 to 20 percent want full-time in the office work so that's the kind of data that companies with which i've worked are seeing is there information about how it um, disaggregates across different sectors or yeah so there's yep there's information so and we're talking here specifically people who are able to work from home, which is about something like about 60% of the American workforce is able to work from home remotely uh, to do a, at least a substantial part of their work from home. So not essential employees. So when you look at the data, this is the average data across all industries. Some industries are more oriented toward working from home like tech sectors. So you'll see something like when you ask people who want to return to the office in the tech sector, you'll find something like maybe closer to 10% than uh, so full-time return to the office and remote work, you'll find something closer to 40%. So there are some sectors which will tend to stand out, but the average number, the averages will be similar across sectors where you'll have a substantial minority wanting full-time remote work, where you'll have the majority wanting hybrid schedule, something like we saw in the polling here, one to two days a week. And then the small minority, 20% maybe, wanting full-time in office work. Mm -hmm. Others? Well, you had mentioned, think, go ahead. You had mentioned earlier about uh, executives uh, wanting people back to work because they feel like you know that's what they grew up with that's their yep. experience space and that's what made them successful i think jp morgan or somebody he wants all his people back he's made that up jamie Damon, yep. yeah uh but what i was wondering have you noticed that uh people like your statistics were showing that they feel like they're more productive at home than they were at work mm -hmm. you think corporations would have uh noticed that and wouldn't be as uh, eager to get people back if they didn't see a uh, reduction in performance by the remote work. Uh, you would think so, but it's not about, this is where I'll get into that into the next section. Okay. But right. This is about how leaders make decisions. You know, it's a pretty well known myth that leaders make their decisions based on the bottom line. They overwhelmingly don't, it's a myth. That's not what leaders actually make their decisions <laughs> based on. They make their decisions based on what they feel comfortable with and what they feel to be right. And they don't really look at what most benefits the bottom line, because if something benefits the bottom line, but it makes them personally uncomfortable, you know, they tend to avoid that sort of decision, the uncomfortable decision that benefits the bottom line. Because there's a lot of research showing that a lot of things that leaders do are pro quite problematic. You know, for example, the kind of interview style that is in companies where you just have an unstructured interview, bring somebody in, talk to them, and then decide whether to hire them or not. That is something that has been shown extensively to really not correlate with good job performance, where it's essentially you're seeing if you click with that person or not. That's <laughs> problematic, that's not good, that's not helpful. But leaders tend to do it because they feel comfortable with it. So that's a decision that leaders do with that very important aspect of things, which is what kind of people you bring on board. Similarly, Jamie Damon uh, and many others are making poor, poor decisions and it will bite them in the butt. I mean, I can tell you about Google. Google, this is public information. So Google in February said that they will bring their employees back to the office and their employees will come back to the office full-time except for 14 days per year, which they can work remotely, which is of course nothing. <laughs> you know, 14 days per year, you could work remotely and the rest of the time you have to be back in the office. G From my internal sources at Google, I learned that this caused a lot of stress and conflict and tension. A number of good people were leaving. <laughs> so just about a week, uh, just about a month ago, and you can look up this information, Google said that they're changing their policy and they're actually going to have a hybrid schedule where people are coming in two to three days to the office and about 20% of the workforce will work full-time remotely because they were losing really some of the, the really good people. So that's an example of where companies you know, made that bad decision and then they turn back because they're losing good workers. But of course, you know, it's pretty hard to make that decision and then change your mind when yeah. you're finding that good workers are leaving. 
other folks. So I was thinking about people and performance and people who are working remotely. And uh, I realized that communication and collaboration that would be very difficult, just like we expressed earlier about meeting remotely. It's, it's good and it's comfortable, but however, it may not be as effective. Mm -hmm. but, but when you really stop and think about the individual performance of someone, that's uh, primarily an intrinsic value. And if a person wants to be successful, an employee, he's going to reach out for that communication and collaboration. He's mm -hmm. going to stomp his feet until he gets it because he's going to get his job done or she, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, it, yeah. Yeah. So, so this, it can it can be overcome and, and should be mm -hmm. less difficult than some people might make it out to be simply because they can. You're absolutely right, Patricia. And this is something I'll talk about closer to the end of the presentation, which is about upskilling in virtual communication collaboration. This is a skill. This is yes. something that can be learned. This is something that can be developed. For, and this is something that companies should be helping people develop Focusing. in the new future, in our new normal. So yes, this is definitely a very important point. If people want to work remotely, they can certainly develop those skill sets and companies should be helping them and supporting them. Exactly. And that's something that's a, an important factor in considering. Anyone else questions on statistics before we go forward? All right. So let's talk about the bad decision-making that leaders tend to make and why they make these bad decisions. So some of the points that were brought up earlier, I said that I'll address it now. There are a number of mental blind spots, cognitive biases, which cause leaders to make bad decisions. Now, if you remember my previous presentation from February, if you were present, I talked about cognitive biases, what these are. These are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brains are wired. There's extensive research on them, on how we make bad decisions, including how leaders make bad decisions. And there are a specific set of errors that are most relevant to working from, to returning to the office and then permanent post-pandemic arrangements. But these are broader patterns that we make in the modern world, in modern decision-making, because of how our brains are wired and we don't realize that we make these bad mistakes. One of these biggest prob big problems is called the status quo bias. We tend to have a preference to stick with the status quo, maintain it or go back to it, whatever we per perceive to be the status quo. Now, leaders who've spent 20, 30 years of their career successful in the office, that's what they're comfortable with. They perceive that as their status quo and they perceive this pandemic as an aberration. So they're kind of blind to major disruptions that resulted from the pandemic. The pandemic has changed very much people's habits, values, norms, their preferences, and especially for younger people. Now, if you think about younger people, they have not succeeded through 20, 30 years of experience in an in-office environment. Leaders who have spent 20, 30 years or 40 years are successful they see the digital revolution, all these digital things as being an add-on to their previous successful in-person interactions. That's what they are succeeding. Younger people see this, the in-office environment, they've grown up native digital. So they see the in-office environment as inherently digital and built up on top of their experience with more digital things. And so they are, saw the pandemic as a return to a future, to their past experience with digital things and as something that's the future. If they can do their work in a comfortable space and a comfortable environment, why not do it? And with a lot of autonomy and flexibility, right? They much prefer that. And so this is a fundamental tension. I was talking to a major CEO of a major food chain company when helping them address, adapt to the pandemic. And she told me of, that, well, 
she really likes having people around and she wants everyone to go back to the office and she really likes that lively environment and that's the way that she succeeded and she wants other people to succeed in that way but when she is trying to hire new people as the food industry is starting to return back to its it's the post-pandemic situation they're finding that one of the first questions they're getting from young leaders that they're recruiting is do I have to move? Can I do this job from home? <laughs> you know? So this is something that they're realizing that, hey, if they want to be successful and if they want to have good talent, you know, they really need to allow substantial remote work, including full-time remote work for some and hybrid schedules for others. So that's an example of it, overcoming the status quo bias, but you know, this is a really hard thing to overcome. Many, many leaders don't. A related problem is called the anchoring bias. Anchoring bias, this has to do with how we interpret information. We're anchored to our initial perceptions, our initial experiences, the initial information we get. So the initial information that leaders get about how to work appropriately and effectively, again, comes from their early experiences. Before the technology age, before the rise of the internet, they're comfortable with those in-person interactions. They're still comfortable calling people on the phone. You know, imagine that, right? The, the, and, you know, kind of joking, I'm pretty comfortable calling people on the phone, but younger people than I and most of you are less comfortable calling people on the phone. And there are many, many other dynamics where the older leaders, they filter their, the new things that they learned through the lens of their old experiences and so they want to go back to what their experiences are and the information that they got. Their information causes them to perceive working from home as an aberration, as something strange and different, something that is not a fit to the previous information that they receive on what works. Whereas for younger leaders, for younger folks, that is very much aligned with what works. So how work should be done? Younger people who are native digital are much better at remote work and much more comfortable with it because it just really fits the way they know and the way that they, they got information because their work is built on top of their first digital experiences. Now, another big, big problem is called the confirmation bias. If you've heard about any cognitive biases, this is probably the one you've heard about. This is, has to do with how we look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that contradicts our beliefs. How this plays out in returning to the office is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly leaders who want to return to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five, is that they don't do in-depth surveys of their population. So they don't gather this hard data on what their employees want on from returning to, to the office, what they want in their post-pandemic office arrangements. And they don't look at the external surveys either that I cited that are of the major damage that would be done from forced in-office work. They ignore this information and they don't do these surveys instead of, you know, look. And so they, all, what they do, and honestly, this is what I've seen in some of the companies that I've, well, talked to, but haven't really <laughs> helped because they didn't really, they weren't a good fit for me, was that when the leaders want to return to the office, the top leader would speak to their C-suite and the C-suite would maybe speak to their VPs. And they're all in a similar position of being successful. They're having long careers being successful in in-office environments. So they really generally want to return to the office and they're uncomfortable with not having their teams, they're not having their employees back in the office and they don't do an in-depth survey of the rank and file, big problem. Another mental blind spot that comes with in a relationship to the confirmation bias is the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect, that speaks to the fact that we look for, we believe that other people who are like us, who are part of our tribe, have the same beliefs, preferences, and values that we do. And that here refers to people who are working in the same company that we do. So people who are part of our tribe, who are working in the same company, we feel they share our preferences. So top leaders would tend to feel that their employees should share their preferences that they do. And so they don't even do surveys to find out what's going on. So coming into the office would be one such preference. And another problem that I've really seen 
is a perception that remote work is fixed, that functional fixedness, the idea that how people started doing remote work in the pandemic is the right way to do it. It's the only right way to function. So for example, when during the emergency shutdowns of March, 2020, the vast majority of companies transitioned to remote work by transposing their in-office culture, their performance evaluation, their ways of training, their ways of managing, their, all of these sorts of things they're, you know, to, from the office, the in-office culture to the remote work. And that's not a really good fit at all. That's a failure to adapt strategically to remote work, but that's what they did. And so right now that image is stuck in their minds and they think, well, I don't want this going forward. Let's just go back to the office. They have this very binary image of what the future looks like. And that's of course a very big problem for making good decisions. Now we'll do another poll. I'm curious from your perspective, which of these cognitive biases might be the most problematic for the return to the office in your workplace? So please go ahead and vote. Which of them might be the most problematic? See that just over half of you voted. Let's get another, the, other, the rest of you voting. Two people left. I'll give you five more seconds. All right, great, everyone voted. Okay, so we see that the status quo bias is the biggest one followed by the anchoring bias. Together they make up over 50% of the problems and the other ones have some impact but less of an impact. All right, I'll take some questions on the cognitive biases because the next part of the presentation will be about how to fix them and I don't want them to get missed if you have any questions about these cognitive biases and how they impact leaders. So the second or the third part of the presentation will be about how to make good decisions. What, is, what are actually the best practices of going back to work? So questions about these cognitive biases as they relate to returning to the office. I was surprised that these companies uh, that have been successful, the leaders that have been successful, uh, could be so through um, status quo. Um, you know, you have to be rapid. I mean, you have to look at the changes coming. Look at Tesla and how the uh, General Motors and Ford are in catch-up mode. They didn't see this as a viable means of transportation. Uh, I would think companies would be looking at, well, to be competitive financially, I need to cut my cost. And if I can reduce the office footprint, um, you know, it's less, you know, you know the deal. So I just, yes. I'm just surprised that they can be, you can say that they're successful, yet the status quo is keeping them stuck in the mud, really. I mean, this yes. is an opportunity to cut costs and be more competitive. You're absolutely right, George. It's a great opportunity, but Look at how many companies failed to get, to react to issues in time. I mean, where's Blockbuster right now, right? <laughs> Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix, right? That it was a huge company, but it missed its opportunity. Where's Toys R Us right now? You know, that's uh, there are so many companies that uh, are gone. Yeah, Great where's, companies. Where's the mail order company called Sears now? There you yeah. go. We're, we're, <laughs> that's yeah. the biggest cognitive bias. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, that's the biggest uh, uh, status quo bias I can think of. Yep, Sears and Kmart. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so many others. I mean, they so, had uh, they had a mail order business in the uh, end of the 1800s. Yep. Yeah. No, it was it was great. They did. They used to be great, and now, you know, it's now, it, not now, so not so much. Yeah, now their shelves are being made into Amazon uh, local warehouses. <laughs> yep, exactly. And so this is an example of what we're talking about here. Companies, leaders make pretty terrible decisions all the time due to the status quo bias, anchoring bias, confirmation bias, false consensus effect, functional fixedness, and other cognitive biases cause them to make bad decisions. This is how the human mind works. You know, the leaders who are the top of companies aren't perfect decision makers. If this is news to you, <laughs> I doubt that this is news to you, right? They're not no. perfect decision makers. And 
they go with their intuition, they do what's comfortable to them. They don't do often what's the right thing for the bottom line, what's the right thing for the company, which would be, yes, of course, you want to cut costs and you this is a perfect opportunity to make cost, cost cuts, especially ones that would cause people to be happy and more productive you know, and uh, increase your retention and re- improve your recruitment. It, mm-hmm. it just makes sense, but leaders often don't do what makes sense because it's, they're uncomfortable with it. And that's not the kind of culture, that's not the kind of atmosphere they would prefer in their company. And so they don't do that. Others. Patricia, did you have something to say? You want to unmute yourself. Yes, I did have something to say, but you um, you spoke about it. So <laughs> I had a question, you answered it. Thank you. Sure. And they're also going to lose their talent, like you said earlier. They're going to lose their best people. So, from a comp- competition perspective, that's another thing. There, you know, somebody else is going to provide that home, you know, work from home uh, option. Mm-hmm. Yep, and well, that's why Google was losing people to Amazon, to Facebook, you know, to Netflix, and uh, they eventually decided, okay, you know, while we would like people to be in the office and we like that culture, <coughs> it's just costing us too much. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, JP Morgan will definitely lose some of its best people. There's no question about it. They will lose some of their best people and there are plenty, plenty of financial institutions that are allowing their employees to work from home. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So yeah, you'll see that happening. I think it's important, this is Don Reed speaking, to keep in mind the uh, reference point we're comparing to. Having come from a heavy background of globally distributed virtual teams, Mm -hmm. that seemed more than work to me. When I came to a place that said, you have to come to this campus every day, and here's your building, and you will sit in this office every day. I looked at like you guys are crackers. (laughs) So... Wow, I wonder where that is. (laughs) So then going back to working remote, so I got a pretty good office set up because I've got a bunch of it at home. For me, it's more than the norm. So it's welcome back to the norm that it's different. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yep. So I, I used to call this a butts and seat mentality versus yes. a productivity mentality. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, I work for an organization, it may have been the same one you were talking about just a second ago, um, that if you were going to work from home for a day, uh, you would have to write a plan and, and list your accomplishments that you expected to do that day or two days or whatever. Um, and it was, and then you'd have to get it, you know, approved. Oh, yeah. uh, but, you know, you could just come into the office and basically warm up that seat for two days and play games on your phone um, (laughs) and maybe do just, you know, whatever triage things you absolutely had to do, but not be nearly as productive as you would have been at home. And that was okay. And so the, like the JP Morgans, I mean, part of that is uh, they may not be looking at the actual productivity other than you know having a um, somebody lord over a kangaroo court of mm-hmm. feeling like oh I've got all these people that I can see that report to me uh, versus getting the actual productivity done and I think that's the key is yeah. uh, are you getting done what you need to do and if you are and everyone else is um, you know then you have to figure out okay is that an okay way of doing it and you go yeah it is. I, it would be great if all people thought that like that. But yeah, the okay. JP Morgans and even you know the Google it, mm-hmm. be, were eventually forced to you know go to this new normal. But you know, of course, they still have their preferences. The leadership they yeah. prefer to see people. They prefer to have that <coughs> being surrounded mm-hmm. by people. They prefer to have butts and seats. They prefer mm-hmm. to make sure that everyone is working and watch over them. That's the preference. And their yeah. preference, their gut intuition is a very, very powerful force in yeah. causing people to make decisions that are pretty bad. And JP Morgan, I can understand Google is, is, is really, uh, is very surprising 
um, <laughs> that they're of that mentality. It's, um, just because yeah. they're such a tech company. Yeah, it is surprising, but it's just, you know, they, yeah, it's the management. Yeah, it's the management. It's all about the management. But then again, you know, the same Google workers will end up having Google Hangout meetings in their <laughs> office with people sure. from around the world. <laughs> sure, I agree. Yeah, no, it's 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 weird, but it's how people feel and how people think and how people make decisions. And you know, one of my goals is to help people realize that their decision-making processes are often broken, and they need to address these cognitive biases. All right, folks. So if you can mute yourself, if you are unmuted. Now, let's go on to the next stage of talking about what are the best practices and what kind of decisions should you be making. The competitive advantage in the new normal, when you're looking at the best practices, what they are, you want team-led hybrid model with fully remote options. And I'll talk about what that is. But basically, hybrid first. So most of your people should be hybrid, one to two days a week, free if they have to. And a substantial minority would you allow them to have fully remote options, something like 10 to 30%, depending on the company, allow them to have fully remote options. So that's what you want. And minority fully remote, that's way you'll gain a competitive advantage and companies will gain a competitive advantage in the factors that we talked about before. Their retention, you'll retain many more people. Your recruitment, you'll recruit quite a bit more people. You'll have quite a bit higher morale. You'll have higher productivity, no question better work-life balance for your teams, mental health and well-being improvement, and your bottom line will be improved as we've talked about here. So clearly this is the right way forward. Now, let's talk a little bit about fully remote options because I often get questions about this. What does that mean? What does fully remote options mean? There are a number of things that you want to be thinking about for fully remote options. Who, how and who do you allow to go fully remote? So how do you make that decision? Who gets to do that? First, if a team decides that it will go fully remote, you want team leaders to be making those decisions of who go, of how often you come into the office. And so team leaders, you don't want the top level CEO and C-suite to be making decisions for everyone. You want them to give broad guidance to the teams and the teams overall, the team, the lower rank and file leaders of the leaders of the rank and file teams should be making a decision for how their team is going to go forward based on what works best for their teams. Some teams will want to go in the office one day a week, some will two, rarely will you, will you want free, but some teams will decide to go fully remote and that's fine. So team leaders. So that's one option for being fully remote. Another is for individuals and hybrid teams. So if your lead team leader wants to do one to two days in the office, but if an individual on that team really wants to do fully remote, if they can be effective while working fully remotely, that should certainly facilitate them work fully remotely and who are made aware of any potential career growth issues because there are going to be career growth issues. No question, if your team, if everyone goes back to the office or if most people from your team go back to the office for one to two days a week, but you are never there, that's going to create challenges for your career growth. So just need to be made aware of that that's an issue. You should may have team building retreats for fully remote teams once a quarter. So that's going to be really important. And I encourage that for all teams. So once per quarter, that will help improve their social bonds and trust. That's what research on remote teams shows. And so you'll also plan team strategy for where that is relevant for those teams at those retreats. Once you decide on what you're going to be doing for the, each individual team decides, okay, you know, we're going to be coming into the office one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, whatever. You'll want to coordinate with which days they'll come into the office. So if you're coming into the office one day a week, of course, all team members should come into the office that day and the same day for two days. You'll want them, your teams to stagger across the week so to have appropriate occupancy for your space. And then once you know, you'll want to reshape your office space. So you'll want to get, after you get the information, you'll be able to decrease your real estate footprint and office services. So if you, let's say, let's say your pandemic occupancy, let's call that 
Now, if you see that coming compared to 100%, on average, you'll have people coming in, you know, one and a half days a week or something like that. Then decrease your office space accordingly. You'll probably be able to get rid of about 60% of your office space. I mean, usually 10 to 20% is obligatory sort of basic needs for office space that you're not going to be able to do without. And then the rest of it is for how many workers are coming in. So you should be able to get rid of something like 60% of your office space if on average your workers are coming in 1.2, 1.5 days a week. And uh, that's office space and services like janitorial security, various products like commercial copiers. And then you want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative. What does that mean to be mostly collaborative? That means that you will get rid of most individual office spaces that you'll retain them for leaders who require them for private conversations and others who also need private conversations. But for everyone else, that will be shift to hot desking because you don't need an office space if you're coming in for one day a week. So it will just be hot desking. And for you know, a team can hot desk together in a certain space. There are various ways of hot desking, but that's going to be that. The majority of your space is going to be collaborative. So right now, most of a space is something like 20% collaborative and 80% individual office space. It should shift to something like one third individual and two thirds collaborative space. By collaborative space, I mean video conference rooms. I mean informal office spaces. So various meeting spaces, large, small, whatever, infor formal, informal, because what you'll be doing in the office, what teams will be doing in the office overwhelmingly will be collaborative work. That's why you'll be coming in for team meetings, brainstorming, working together on projects. That's what you will be coming into the office for. You'll be doing your individual work at home. Research has shown that people are overall quite a bit more productive on individual work. They're more productive on individual work at home than even the average level of productivity. So the average level of productivity is 10 to 15% better and it's higher for individual tasks. Whereas collaborative tasks are generally speaking, not always far from all collaborative tasks, but more of them are better done in the office with that in-person environment. So you wanna change that office space to be much more collaborative and have appropriate technology for, your, for people who are coming in hybrid. So you'll have, let's say some, some people in the office, let's say, you know, if you have a team where two people are fully remote and you'll have a meeting where uh, let's say four people are in the office and two people are remote. And then you'll need to have a good appropriate video conference spaces where the people who are remote will not be second class citizens where they can participate fully in that meeting. So that's going to be something that you'll need to have good technology for. You'll also need to have funding for home offices. This is going to be really important. So you'll use savings from real estate to fund home offices. This home office now is a permanent post-pandemic arrangement will be part essentially of your workspace. It'll be part of your workspace though for the company that it'll be disaggregated, it'll be distributed geographically not simply at the company campus, company headquarters and various other offices, but in the office of each individual employee. So of course you should need to provide funding for them just like you provide funding for, your, for the office space in your offices. So you want to fund their internet connection and you don't want people working on basic broadband, which is really bad for modern streaming video conferences. You'll want equipment and that includes video cameras, that includes microphones that includes good laptop, lighting, all of that sort of stuff. You'll want ergonomic furniture. You want people to be comfortable when they're working in their home office. So make sure to provide them with ergonomic furniture, soundproofing. A lot of people complain about loudness in their office. So provide them with soundproofing, room separators. A lot of folks are don't have a separate office that they can easily put into their home. So there are room separators which can help with that and so on, various other things. And especially you'll want to provide things for, you'll want to provide better, more funding for working mothers. When we're looking at surveys and how people work, working mothers have the biggest challenges in terms of working from home. So on average, I, when companies I work with provide two to $3,000 going forward for their employees per year, for their work from home arrangements and their working mothers get $500 more 
per year to address specific needs that working mothers have that average folks may not. So I'm curious to ask you in the poll whether you or any members of your team would benefit from funding for these purposes, establishing quite uncomfortable office space and acquiring quality technology equipment and broadband access. Would that be beneficial for you? Let's see, so two thirds of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Great. Okay, so we see that most of you would benefit from funding. Some of you have your office set up well, so that would not be something that would benefit you. But most of you, of course, not okay. of course, but most of you would benefit. All right, I have to ask this question though. Sure. I so I would benefit from it, mm -hmm. okay. But if I wasn't given that funding, mm -hmm. I would I would still acquire it. So, um, you know, the, the 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 real question is 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 uh, is did I need it? And the answer was mm -hmm. no. Okay, so you specifically would not, but there are many many people who would need it and who would want it and who would perceive it. If, they're, if this is a permanent arrangement where they're doing work from the company from home, the company, it would be A, fair for the company to pay for some of their home equipment and B, it would make them more productive. Now, yeah. if now, so- now, now, one area I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, some type of stipend for it would be fine. Uh, one area um, many companies worry about is, is the ergonomics of yep. employees at home. Yes. And so, you know, getting them a proper chair or something like that uh, mm -hmm. is important. And I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ergonomics is, all, is one thing. Soundproofing is another thing that employees generally tend to not pay for themselves. Yeah. And you really, employees would feel it's a little bit unfair to pay for that themselves. Equipment, mm -hmm. internet connection, those are all things that companies should be providing for their employees if their employees are working for them. It's, a, it's something they're providing in the office and it's something that they should be providing in the home. So um, that is so from the I've perspective had, of, go ahead. I've had problems with that though, because some people decide they want to live like 50 miles outside of some place on a mountainside mm -hmm. and uh, there is no internet there. And they're like, well, give me satellite, uh, uh, a satellite phone. Or, uh, there, there has to be some relative thing like you get x number of dollars a month and that's what i'm saying two to three thousand yeah. dollars is what companies that i will advise that uh, they've done so two th yeah of course you don't make it unfair you don't make you know people just you know <laughs> using up uh, all this budget on you know let's say reconstructing their home to add an additional room for their home office right yeah that's that's yeah. that's not something you want to pay for you give them say this is you know your two thousand your three thousand you know, depending on location you know, whatever situation and you, you use it however you want, and then an additional $500 for working mothers because we've been finding that their conditions are such that they would really benefit from that for allowing them to work more productively. So that is definitely what you want to do. You don't want to give people special privileges if they are you know living 50 miles from anywhere. Yeah, so I work at Thornell and during this outage, I'm um, during the um, COVID, one of the things I realized is, is there are some people, senior engineers who make like $150,000 a year, and they refuse to spend a single freaking penny of their own money on anything they use for their job, even if they're sitting at their house. Yes. <laughs> and like, yes. It's like, but dude, just go to Amazon and search for a USB microphone. You'll have such a better experience. And they're just like, no, they don't provide it. I'm going get it. Yep. Yeah, th this is what I'm talking about. This is, there are many people like that. And this is why you really want to fund their work from home. They'll be more productive. That will be better for the company. It'll be better for the individual. Everyone is better off and you don't need to worry about questions of fairness and you know what you'll get and what not. And I was asked about pens and pencils. I said, if you need it, you can drive in and get it. <laughs> right, well, it's much better to you know say you have a $2,000 budget, you do it what you will. So, I have, um, so then the individual would not buy the equipment or fixtures themselves and charge it off on their taxes. They wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, 
at working from home, we can then uh, take one third, I guess it is, of our mortgage as well as their water and heating and cooling and cable expense and charge that off on our taxes as a business expense. Whereas with the Department of Energy, oftentimes then if, uh, if you're given equipment to use, um, then you can't give it back to DOE. I mean, it has to be swiped. It has, you know, so there's, I guess the, the company is taking the burden off the individual when it comes to providing them with the, the um, equipment. But however, if an individual is going to charge their residents in part as a tax burden, then, you know, there's, there's another benefit to working from your home. Sure, I mean, the sense? company, right, the company is not paying the individual for them to right. uh, use their office space to work from home. So the individual okay. can, char can yeah, have a tax deduction on that. Well, but that's, yeah, that's separate from funding for equipment and internet connection, ergonomic furniture, because of course, if the company provides you with an expense account for that, you're not going to be taking it off your taxes. <laughs> right. Actually, I'm no tax expert, but if I'm working from home just because I work from home for my for the company that I work for, I don't know if I can actually take that off. If I was a um, an LLC, you know, if I had a company that I was I had a contract with ORNL to work at ORNL, I could take that off on my taxes. Maybe, uh, but I, yeah, I don't know not, if you can actually do that. Tax I have. Oh, okay. Okay, so thank you. Maybe other I, folks can, I can, can pursue that. Well, everyone, maybe you might be able to get a tax deduction. So check into that, yeah. tax, talk with your accountant. <laughs> yeah, my husband was a CPA and- um, Oh yeah. He set me up with that. It works. Oh. Well, there you go. Excellent. There you go. Okay. So you should check into that, get some tax deduction for everyone, yeah. Uh, this is worth the price of admission, <laughs> as people say. All right, let's go on. Talk about the next step. So revising performance evaluation. This is another issue that really needs to be addressed. That people are not thinking about, we kind of brought it up briefly earlier in the discussion of the statistics. People are very much oriented, leaders are very much oriented toward people just coming into the office and spending time working. That's not great. That's not what you should be focusing on. You need to be focusing on productivity, on your accomplishments, on your deliverables. That's what you need to be focusing on. So try instead of tracking, observing people working and saying, okay, they're working because they're here. <laughs> You want to be focusing on how productive they are. What kind of tasks are they getting accomplished? How good are the tasks that are getting accomplished? What kind of deliverables are they delivering? How good are those deliverables? So that's one aspect of revising performance evaluation. Another aspect, so this is from individual tasks and the collaborative tasks as well. So I want to make mention of that as well. They're both individual tasks and collaborative tasks that you want to be evaluating. And you want to change from annual performance evaluations Sure, again, dependent on work, you know, the observing people working to weekly report evaluations and check-in meetings. So best practice when you're looking at employee productivity on their individual and collaborative tasks is to have a weekly check-in on how they're doing with their tasks. Because you can, you're looking at their tasks and deliverables and accomplishments. So how this works is that an employee would and then uh, their, with their direct supervisor, they would meet once a week for a 15 to 30 minute meeting. Before that, the employee would send in a re brief report of you know, what they focused on that, that week, their top three tasks, activities that they focused on that week, approximately how much time they spent on it, what kind of problems they encountered, what kind of, of, what kind of challenges they had, what, how they dealt with those challenges, what they plan to be focusing on next week, and then just a self-evaluation of their performance on a scale of one to five or whatever you want to do. And then the supervisor would respond briefly in writing to that report. And then they would meet and discuss the report, discuss the accomplishments. The supervisor would provide coaching to the employee on what they could have been doing better, if anything, for how to solve challenges, agree or, re or revise on things for next week, and then agree or revise on the self-evaluation the employee 
gave themselves. So that would be that weekly meeting, 15 to 30 minutes. And that's something that should be not simply about the performance evaluation itself, but that just takes about five to 10 minutes of the meeting from the meetings that I've observed. The a significant part of that meeting should be a check-in on how the employee is doing in general with their work, with their life, work-life boundaries, you know, their connection to company culture, their understanding of what their role is, of the strategy, all of that sort of stuff. Because if you're gonna have many more people working remotely permanently, you are in hybrid, you definitely want people to be more connected to the company culture. And they're kind of less connected when they're working remotely. So these meetings, people feel most connected to the company culture for their direct supervisor. That's what the research suggests. So you want those brief meetings to help facilitate that connection as well, and to help the company be connected to the employee and see what's going on with each individual employee. I'm curious, again, we're going to do a poll on what your thoughts are on revising this performance evaluation. Do you think you're revising this performance evaluation to align with this more hybrid remote work style be valuable for your workplace, as I mentioned, that oriented toward productivity instead of time spent and oriented toward not the big annual evalu evaluation, but more regular, shorter evaluations weekly or something like that? See more than half of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds to vote if you didn't yet. All right. So we see that the large majority of you feel that this would be a very quite beneficial transition. So 80% of you versus 20%. So great to see that. And so that's something for you to keep in mind about other folks. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them before I go on to the next point. All right, going on. Adjusting your culture, adapting your culture to this new normal. This is something that you wanna be thinking about. How do you adapt your culture effectively? to what we're doing here. And this is both the hybrid and fully remote options. You want to replace office culture style bonding with options that are fully native. So Zoom happy hours have shown been shown not to work. So you don't want those Zoom happy hours. Of course, the hybrid activities, you can do some in office style culture, happy hours and so on, that's great. But you'll have a number of fully remote workers. And also for the time that you'll be spending remotely, you don't want to do things like happy hours so if you're only coming in one day a week. You want native virtual formats of culture interaction. And those 15 to 30 minutes are meetings with your supervisor are one way of doing that. Another is a text-based morning update where you connect with everyone. You have in your, whether you're using Slack or Microsoft Teams or Trello, you have a team individual channel or card where you create a personal card for personal interaction. So you have a morning update or text-based where you say what you've been up to, how you're feeling, what your personal life has been going, what you plan to focus on and work that day, and a fun fact about you that other coworkers may not know. So, and then you respond to three other people who shared their morning updates. And that way you are more human to each other. You connect, you humanize, each other and you feel connected, you feel part of a team. It's kind of like replacing a water cooler conversation with a native virtual format. And you also use that same channel or card for personal chats. Anything you want to share about yourself, your life throughout the day, you can chat there with your coworkers. Then another thing that you want to do that's beneficial for adapting your culture is digital coworking. That means that once a day you go into a video conference call with all of your coworkers for about an hour or more, but at least an hour, where you turn your microphones off, so not bothering anyone, you leave your sound on so that you can hear what's going on, and you have optional video on or not, depending on how you feel, depending on your preferences. Then if you have, and then you just work together, you just chat at the beginning, say what you intend to work on, and then you, know, you go for your tasks. And as you have a question, as you have, you know, unclear on something, or you just want to share something that's relevant, 
you chat to your coworkers because you turn on your microphone and chat to them. And so that creates a real sense of team camaraderie of co-working together. And that, that provides the benefit of the in-office co-working without actually being physically present in the office. Virtual mentorship. That's been something that's really effective. So you want to provide mentoring to others. People have really lost benefits of being mentored from especially junior staff. So you want to provide senior staff mentoring. You want to provide junior staff with mentoring from senior staff. And what we found to be most effective is having one senior person from your own team, as well as one senior person from another team, because especially junior folks in who are working more remotely or even hybrid when they're coming in one day a week, they're not getting to know other parts of the company. So if you're providing them with someone from another team, they get to know and form networks with others from other parts of the company. So that's beneficial. Addressing DEI concerns. Now, interestingly, when you're looking at results on what workers want, what minority workers want, many fewer of them want to return to the office. For example, for tech workers, if you look at tech workers who want to go back to the office full-time, 20% of white tech workers want to go back to the office full-time, according to surveys, only 3% of black tech workers want to go back to the office full-time. And when you look at why, it's because in the office, they face microaggressions, discrimination of various sort. And at home, of course, they face much less discrimination, much less microaggressions. They still face some of these microaggressions and discrimination. So you wanna make sure to address DI concerns virtually. There's going to be different ways of addressing them virtually than you address them in person. So digital discrimination, as well as issues of interruption and privilege. So for example, you will tend to see that minority workers and women tend to be interrupted much more often than white male workers in conversations, in meetings. And that's just one way of privilege showing itself. It's quite problematic where the interruptions, people being talked over women, minorities being talked over, that's a big problem. And there are many, many other ways of people being not, who don't have privilege, feeling put down in virtual environments that need to be addressed. All right, so let's do another poll, adapting your organizational culture. Do you think you're adapting the organizational culture to align with a more hybrid remote work style would be valuable for your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. All of these things that we talked about, or at least some of them. See that half of you voted. Get some more. I'll give you five more seconds to vote. All right, so we see about the same 80% of you feel that it would be quite valuable to revise your culture to adapt to a more hybrid remote work style. Great to hear that. All right. I'll take any questions if there are questions. Patricia, okay. uh, go ahead, yes. Why, why would you not? I mean, honestly, if you were gonna exercise that type of work environment, you would have to, to be the most effective, wouldn't you? I, I agree, but that's why I have the polling options and some people feel that they that's not something that would be effective or a good idea, so. Okay. <laughs> you know, I believe that this is the, uh, definitely, obviously this is something I advise, but if, you know, obviously not everyone agrees, 80% agree. <laughs> so in my situation, I work in manufacturing. So the majority of our employees are working on the production floor. And so that's obviously not the environment that we could go um, and have the majority of people working from home. So that, that's why I answered, no, it wouldn't be mm -hmm. beneficial for us, but that's just because it's definitely a different environment. Oh yeah, definitely a different environment. But what, what, what I've been finding is that when you're looking at com workers who can work remotely, those are kind of a different subset of workers. So for example, the national restaurant chain that I've been advised on coming back to the office, of course, they had their essential employees all the time working from their restaurant chains, <laughs> delivering pizzas and so on. So they're, they're, they, they had their essential employees working during the pandemic. We're only talking about back office staff, the remote workers who can work remotely. Um, similarly, let's say you know, Siemens, industrial giant, 
has also instituted the hybrid policy with lots of remote options for all of their workers who can work from home. Target, of course, they have a lot of essential employees who need to be in the store, but for the back office employees, for the ones who can, they implement a hybrid policy with some significant remote only options. And of course, they're changing their culture in regard to those employees. So there can be changes made to adapt some aspect of your organization to be to having this more high, more culture that's oriented toward remote slash hybrid work. You just made me think of something, you know, uh, thinking of the Clayton home scenario, you've got a lot of uh, businesses where it's hybrid, like you say, you've got tech folks that can work from home, senior management maybe can work from home, but you also have the production lines and the folks, the field management and so forth that have to be there every day. Yep. So they're driving their cars, paying for gas to get to the office, mm -hmm. the remote folks gain time of day by not commuting, save money on gas. So it's almost like they're, you, you almost create a uh, cultural problem by not providing incentive or financial benefits for those that do have to go to work versus working remote. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many benefits for, you know, uh, being able to be home, oh, yeah. dealing with things versus going to work. Yet, if you create this environment where it's a hybrid, you've almost created a situation where you're going to have to uh, recognize or, or deal with um, uh, inequality, I guess, uh, between. Yes. Yep. And so one of the things that I brought up earlier in the surveys is that remote worker, people who work a substantial amount of time remotely are willing to take an average of an 8% salary cut for their ability to work remotely. And I'm not suggesting that you actually cut people's salaries because people perceive that to be pretty unfair. <laughs> but uh, what has been, what the companies that I'm working on, most of them intend to do is talk to people and say, hey, if you want to work fully remotely, well, that will be something that you will be less eligible for salary increases and more of your the salary increases will be going to people who are coming in, you know, doing hybrid work or essential workers who need to remote work more from the actual place of work. So they will be getting less of a salary increase in the future. And overwhelmingly, they are quite comfortable with that. <laughs> people are willing to trade the flexibility of working from home and for a slightly lower future salary increase. You finding companies that are willing to do that across the board? Oh yeah, absolutely, why not? Yeah, they're, they're just having these conversations and saying like, look, this is gonna be, if this is something that you want to do, especially for people who want to do fully remote, this is gonna be what you will do. And people are overwhelmingly willing to make that trade. Well, I worked for a company in Idaho and uh, for uh, 20 years, and we uh, it was a, literally a, an hour bus ride to the job site, and and you also had folks that could work in town, so there was a distinct advantage. You gained two hours a day if you could work yep. from the town, from town, but there was no incentive financially um, to make you want to go out to the desert and work. So I don't know if they've changed that since I left, but uh, yeah, this so is I, I'm surprised that it's that. Yep. Common. The, go ahead. I'm just saying I'm surprised it's that common that you're finding companies that are creating that uh, financial to be clear, incentive. It's not common. It's something that the companies I'm working with are doing because I'm suggesting it as part of the oh, research. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Yep. okay. So the when when we're looking at the research and saying that on average people are willing to take an eight percent pay cut to work from home, that means that it's a good idea to say from the perspective of, okay, how much are you paying your people? This is an area that you can cut costs in the future, have a conversation with them. Are they willing to accept a lower salary in exchange for in, in the future, not cutting their salary, but lower increases, lower raises in the future. And yeah, overwhelmingly people are willing to accept that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about upskilling. So upskilling your workers. Upskilling your workers for this new model is going to be quite important. This is something that folks don't think enough about. They think, okay, we're gonna have this small model, have hybrid work and so on. 
and they don't think that they need to train their workers for it. But effective hybrid work is something that you need to train people for. For example, how what will they do in the office? What will they do at home? Right now, many people are working, people who work during the pandemic remotely did all their work remotely. Previously, they did all their work in the office. Hybrid work will mean a differentiation of work. You will need to choose what work to do at home, what work to do in the office. So let's say you're coming into the office one day a week, you maybe spend half of that day on collaborative tasks, and then you have about you know, maybe half a day for your individual tasks that you kind of go hot desk. You need to choose the right tasks and you need to prepare for your collaborative activities well. Whereas the, you need to choose what you're going to do at home, your individual tasks. So that's something for you to be thinking about what kind of work, and that's just one example of what effective hybrid work means and how do you train people for effective hybrid work because people are not prepared to do effective hybrid work right now. So those are the things to think about. Then effective virtual communication. We talked about this quite a bit. Uh, we talked about this earlier. How do you communicate effectively virtually? That means knowing how to read people's digital body language, digital signals, knowing how to have you know, maybe you should go out and buy a USB mic and hopefully the company will provide one for you. But good, good quality audio, video, what that means. How do you present yourself effectively virtually where you can't read people's body language and signals nearly as well as you could previously in person. And effective virtual collaboration. How do you connect, collaborate effectively virtually, especially when you're having a hybrid situation where you're coming into the office one day a week all the other parts of the time you're collaborating virtually. What does it mean to collaborate for effectively in person versus virtually? What do you do? How do you do it? So all of those sorts of things are upskilling opportunities where you can really train people for all of these things, train people for the workforce of the future, for this new normal, and they will be much better off and your company will be much better off. And so I'm going to do a vote on professional development. Do you think you or members of your team might benefit from professional development on improving the effectiveness of any of these following your hybrid work, your virtual communication, or your virtual collaboration? Please go ahead and vote. Give you five more seconds. All right, so this seems to be really popular getting, so over 90% of you would like training for some of these areas. Great to hear it. Okay, any questions before moving onward? If I could offer a comment, I think it will lead to a yes. question, but if you look at the characteristics of having people work either or the hybrid or remote scenario, and <clears throat> the types of interactions and rules that people operate by, if you compare that to lean agile implementations, particularly like in a scaled out framework methodology, the canvases you write for the teams and the expected behavior, and Workers, the two almost look identical. Mm. So there's, I, I would suggest there's significant um, credibility to the difference in the characteristics and how people interact, but there's also some really good models out there that clearly demonstrate um, they're based on these characteristics as well. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you have a question or just do you want to make that comment? Let's a comment to see what else I can prompt. Let's see who's the big waterfall proponents here and how they come back at it. Okay, don't really know too much about that. But yeah, like I said, uh, there's certainly specific things that I know about effective training for effective hybrid work, communication, collaboration. So thank you for that, Don. All right. Now, uh, I mentioned 
the additional resources that I'll provide for you, for those who want them, of course. One is the white paper on returning to office and benchmarking to best practices. It has a very, this presentation just kind of skimmed the surface of that white paper and goes in depth into all of these areas, provides information on that. Another one is my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, which talks about these cognitive biases and how to address them. And finally, happy to provide coaching on how to help you integrate this information into your work. Free coaching sessions available for the first three claimants. And we'll do the same polling for folks who want those resources. And while you're answering the polls, Please go ahead and ask any questions that you have not asked yet throughout the presentation. Any final questions? <coughs> yes, George. Right. All right then. So it seems to oh, I've answered all the questions throughout the presentation. Great. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, that was excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, it. Great, great presentation. Yep. Enjoyed it. Thanks it a lot. It was good. Thank you. <clears throat> great presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, I've enjoyed both of your talks immensely. I look forward it. to hearing more from you. Great. I'll send the white paper and you'll have that information. Thank, okay, you. thank you. All right, everyone. This has been great and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Glib. I, I will now share my screen to provide the claim code. There is.